Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to your next little lecture. Sorry for being so quiet the past couple of months. It's been rather hectic. Uh, I got a couple of questions um, in the comments about what are buy factors and how do you estimate them in M+. So I thought I'd make a quick video um, on the concept. So, and also showing you how to do it in M+. So as I mentioned before, you get various types of factorial models. Now, one of the interesting concepts that I'm working on is a concept called GRIT by Angelina Duckworth. She said that GRIT is a function of a person's overall level of passion, right? So the amount of interest they have over a long period of time in a specific goal and their perseverance, the amount of energy that they put into something, pushing through even the most difficultest of situations. Now, this model or, or this concept is really interesting because it's been subject to a lot of controversy over the past couple of years. People say that grit doesn't exist, or not at least how it's measured. Um, and most studies where her instrument was used, the grit O or grit S scale, we kind of only find a single factorial model, although conceptually it's constructed as being a function of two factors. Right? So it's been subjected to a, a, a lot of um, psychometric evaluations and therefore it's a nice example to kind of show you how value factor analysis works. So as I mentioned before, you get various types of factorial structures. You get a unidimensional model where grit is a function of all of the items um, measured on the grit O scale. Right? So here you would specify grit by item 1 to 11 or 1 to 12. Okay, pretty straightforward. Um, you get a uh, um, two first order factorial model where Angelina Duckworth said that grit measures perseverance and interest. So passion and perseverance. And these items make up perseverance and these items make up a first order factor called consisting of interest and they're correlated. So this is a two factor first order correlated factorial model, right? But then other people also indicated, but no, if these two factors are there, there should be a higher order of grit. So in other words, overall grit is then a second order factorial model, which is a function of consistency of interest and perseverance of effort. So a second order factorial model comprised out of two first order factors. Okay, so a lot of people have tested this and um, unfortunately there's been various factorial models that was found to fit the data in different contexts and etc. So it might not be a very good scale. However, um, recently, it was indicated or suggested that maybe grit is not a function of perseverance of interest and effort, so it's not a hierarchical model, but maybe it's a bifactor model. Now, what is a bifactor model? A bifactor model basically says that we are measuring by this one instrument an overall experience of grit, right? Because that's what the instrument measures, right? But when we control for grit, there should also be two other factors because this is what the instrument says it measures, interest and perseverance. So what then happens is that grit, right? Or, sorry, the two specific factors, which is perseverance and interest, is then the outcome of the variance or the leftover variance when we control for an overall experience of grit. In other words, when overall grit is there, so we take the variance away, because this one wants to absorb as much variance as it possibly can, right? How much variance is then left for these two specific factors, right? So when we control for grit, what this is then, um, it, um, perseverance, and this is then another specific factor called interest. So like I've mentioned before, um, the general factor is usually the one with the most constraints in this model, but everything is basically allowed to be estimated freely. So in a normal factorial model, you would constrain this item to be one and that item to be one, and then allow the other ones to be freely estimated based on that constraint. Where here, all of these items are basically um, allowed to be freely estimated. But as you can see, that there are no correlations here, right? There are no interactions, right? Because this is important, because if we correlate this, we're measuring something totally different. Um, because we say that because we're controlling for the overall variance in grit, these two factors are 
individual, they are alone, they're specific, they are function by themselves, they're unrelated to anything else in a bifactor model. Because we're interested in all three of these factors together. We're interested in a person's overall experience of grit, but also his perseverance and also his interest. Right? So these three things are then, from a bifactor perspective, seen as separate. And therefore, when we estimate it in M+, plus, we constrain all of these relationships to be zero. In other words, we can also use like a rotation to kind of say that these things are then um, orthogonal um, in nature. So none of these things relate to each other. So that's basically a bifactor model. A bifactor model, just to summarize, is a combination of a general factor comprised of all of the items, right? And targeted specific factors, which um, are made up of the items that's supposed to lead up to this overall uh, first order or specific factor, right? So general factor, all of the items, specific factors, like you would do a normal um, CFA basically. But we do not correlate these things and we allow these items to be freely estimated. Okay. Does that make sense? I hope so. So let's do this in M+. So what I've already done is that this is based on um, a study that we recently submitted. So I'm just going to run you through the syntax for a moment. So um, we specify our data like normally. This is all the variables in the data set. Um, we indicated all the missing values are minus 999. Um, because these things are rated on a scale of 1 to 5, we can indicate that they're categorical. Um, a 1 to 4, categorical um, or not, it doesn't really matter. For this example, um, here we indicate the items that we are going to use. I've already done a whole bunch of analysis on this. I know that item 4 is a crappy item, so it was a re removed. We specify um, our estimator and our processors. I just added start values earlier to test something. Um, but you can also put in a like a rotation here and indicate that it's like a, uh, on a target uh, orthogonal. Right, so we constrain all of these relationships to be zero. But I like to do these things manually because then I know exactly what's going on in my data set. I don't really like all of these fancy M plus commands. So it's easier for me to kind of make program these things manually. So I'll show you. So in the actual model command, this is where it becomes interesting. So we would specify the normal first order factors like we would do normally. So passion or interest is made up of items 2, 3, 5, 7, 8, and 11. And perseverance is made up of items 1, 9, 10, 6, and 12. Okay. Um, but unlike a normal CFA or a normal first order factor where these items are constrained to be 1, we allow them to be freely estimated. So we open them up freely estimated. But then we also specify a general factor of grit, right? So two specific factors and one general factor. The general factor is then made up of all of these items together. And again, we just uh, freely estimate the first factor or the first item. Okay. So these things can kind of compete for variance now. What's also important is that we constrain each one of the overall variances to one, right? This is also to help ensure a convergence because we basically say that each one of these factors are unique by themselves. They're not made, they don't influence each other or whatever, so it's important. And then here I specify that all of the relationships between these factors should be constrained to zero, so that they should not be there. Okay. Then I just usually ask for, well, you can ask for sample statistics, um, standardized, um, your standardized values, um, and this will kind of give you what you kind of need. So click run, scroll down, thank goodness, no errors, hallelujah. Here we can basically see that our sample is 1,188. Um, our model fit indicates really good fit because this is one of the benefits of bifactor models is that they show really good uh, data model fit, right? Um, RMC is acceptable, not significant though, but still acceptable. You do get penalized for sample size in RMC um, and SRMR is smaller than 0.8. So all of the factors actually kind of show that this is a good model. But as we know that we don't just look at model fit, we also have to look at measurement quality, right? So I'm not going to show you the, this, the 
Normal ones, I'm going to show you the standardized ones. So here what's important is that the general factor needs to show, uh, needs to be relatively well defined. What does this mean? That all of the factors need to kind of load onto it, right, significantly. Um, and yeah, it should usually be around 3.5 and upwards. But uh, in, in bifactor models and stuff, we're more concerned with regards to the strength and the pattern of the relationships, right? But from this, from this perspective, we want to have a relatively well-defined G-factor and two relatively well-defined specific factors. So the G-factor basically says that you can see that all of these factors load significantly with the exclusion of item 11, right? So item 11 here does not load significantly onto the G-factor but it seems that it is a stronger indicator of passion. So more variance is pulled towards the interest component. And this is okay, right? We just have to report it. So this is important. The majority of these factors need to load significantly. Usually want them to be um, larger than 0 0.35, right? But overall, if they all load significantly with small um, residual variances um, here, and small standardized errors, we should be okay. Then we also look at the specific factors, so passion and perseverance, their loadings, they need to be well-defined um, for a bifactor model to fully realize. So all of these things need to be bigger than 0 0.35 and load significantly, they are all of these ones as well. Um, as you can see, these relationships are constrained to zero, so they are not there. Um, our residual variance, our variances of our factors were constrained to one because they're all independent and unique. Um, residual, er, residual variances or item uniqueness is good. Um, and the variances that they declare are also quite nice. So overall, we have a very nice G factor, a uh, very nice bifactor factor model. Um, what is just interesting, I just want to show you, always just check your diagram to make sure, but this is kind of what it then looks like, right? So always make sure that you also just check your diagram to see that you've specified it um, correctly, okay? All right, so now that we know what a bifactor is, how do we use a bifactor in further analysis? Okay, so let's see. Um, so I've already actually gone and I've tested all of these models for us. So I've went and I tested the CFI for this, 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 and this, and this is the results that I got. At, ooh, shoot. As you can see, um, the unidimensional model, so where grid is a one-factor model, did not fit the data very well. Crappy fit. As you can see, the two-factor model, where grid is just a correlated, is made up of two correlated first-order factors, passion and perseverance, it almost gets there, but not, right? So TLI is low, Remisa is too high, SRMR just, just meets it, so no. Then I created a second order factor out of it, and these things should give you pretty much exactly the same results mathematically. Um, just forget this one um, for a moment, or just forget this in general. And I also tested the bifactor model. So the bifactor model can see it does meet CFI and TLI criteria. RMCA is smaller than 0 0.8, SRMR is smaller than 0 0.4, and as you can compare, it is the lowest chi square out of all of them. 200 versus 2000, lowest AIC, BIC, and ABIC, adjusted BIC value. So overall, we can clearly see that GRIT is not a second order factor model. It doesn't fit the data in this case. It is clearly a bifactor model, right? Does this make sense? Perfect. So how do we utilize bifactors in further analysis, like in structural models? So let's say, because Duckworth indicated that GRIT is an indicator of performance and achievement. Um, I went at it and wanted to see how does overall grit, perseverance, and interest relate to task performance. So because we constrain all of these factors um, to be totally independent from one another, we can clearly see what unique contribution each one of these factors make to task performance. And that's one of the major benefits of bifactor models. We can look at the unique contribution of perseverance the unique contribution of interest and of overall grit on task performance to see which factor relates to it um, better and how much. So let's go to M plus and see. So I have um, everything basically stays the same, right? The only thing is that we add 
task performance, the items of task performance in the use variable command. We can just take that out. Um, we keep our bifactor model exactly as we've indicated, and we specify the task performance, normal CFA, first order factor is made up of these items. Then a normal regression, we indicate that task performance is regressed on our general factor, task performance is regressed on passion, and task performance is regressed on perseverance. Pretty straightforward. Um, so let's run this and see what happens. Okay, no error, thank goodness, everything's fine. Um, here we can see the, the model fits the data, right? Barely, we can do some adjustments on the, on the task performance scale if we want, but it does fit the data. This is below, this is below 0.8, so we are good to go. We go to the standardized results. And what's important for us is to make sure that everything kind of has the same pattern as the original. So here we can see all the factors load very well. All of these factors load very well. Um, the G factor is pretty well defined. This item not, but we don't want to take it out because then we change the concept of grid. So we keep it in. Task performance, all the items load significantly. And this is then what we are interested in. Here we can now clearly see that overall grid, right? predicts or is associated with, not predicts, is associated with task performance because this is cross-sectional data. So relatively strong beta value, perseverance, right, the ability to push through even difficult situations, also very strongly related to task performance, right? However, interest is not. So in this sample, it is clear that overall grit and perseverance are predictors or are, are strongly associated with um, task performance, however, interest is not. This is a very interesting conclusion for us. So it doesn't matter, right, how much interest I have in my work or my studies or my tasks. It, it only matters that I should have high levels of grit and that I should have high levels of perseverance. This, then, is what we find. So, again, just make sure that we check our model. Everything seems fine, right order, so we are good to go. As with any other, um, um, with any other like uh, seg model, we kind of look at the amount of variance that's declared, and here we can clearly see that the amount of variance declared in task performance is 44%, 44.9%. So that's quite a lot. All right. So um, I really hope that you guys had. Uh, you guys could learn something today and that you found this interesting and that you found this meaningful. So if you guys have any questions, um, you know where to find me. Have an amazing day.